Hello everybody, we welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society and in today's video we're taking a look at the brief amazing life of Jacob Miller. When we scan over the life stories of most reggae greats, they are mostly remarkable tales of trials, setbacks and victories. But the life of Jacob Killer Miller is something that would make for a great movie. It would be a story about a determined, super talented, funny, likable character who was more of a force of nature than a man. His becoming a musician seemed destined as he came from a musical family tree. His father, Sidney Elliott, was a famous singer and he was the first cousin of British reggae star Maxi Priest as well as the first cousin of American hip-hop star Heavy D. Endowed with a magnetic personality, endless energy and unbelievable talent, he rose from humble beginnings to prominence as a larger-than-life hero and was one of the icons of 20th century reggae music. He was an artist that was loved by all and had something for everyone. He could be as militant as Peter Tosh on one hand and as playful as Ika Mouse on the other. But just before he could become a global superstar, he died at the age of 27, another sad addition to the ensemble of superstars who have died at that age. The story of Jacob Miller began on the 4th of May 1952 in the town of Mandeville in Jamaica. Born to single mom Joan Ashman after a brief relationship with musician Sidney Elliott. His mother noticed that music was in his blood when as a toddler he was always trying to make music either by clapping his hands or drumming on any surface he could find. In search of greener pastures, his mother moved to America and sent him to stay with his aunt who ran a hotel in Kingston on 21 Russo Road. He grew up with a fierce desire to become a successful musician and even as a little boy, anyone with eyes could see that Jacob was determined to make it in life. In Kingston those days, if one wanted to become a singer, the first place that would come to mind was the great Studio One owned by the legendary Coxon Dodd. Jacob Miller used to hang around the studio as a 15 year old and attached himself to then upcoming singer Al Campbell. He eventually got the chance to record a few songs at Studio One in 1968, including the song Love is the Message. Coxon Dodd didn't pay much attention to Miller's music, but it caught the attention of Augustus Pablo and his brother Garth, who began to develop an interest in Jacob's talent and would call upon him a few years later. During this waiting period, Miller continued practicing, hanging around studios and watching the established artists ply their trade. He was very likable as he was extremely funny and kept boasting to anyone that would listen in his usual jovial fashion of how he would become the next big star. When Augustus Pablo and his brother launched their own record label called Rockers in 1972, they engaged Miller and recorded a new version of Love is the Message. And over the next 18 months, Miller delivered five more songs for Pablo, each one a Rockers Records classic. These early singles and their popularity began to earn him a strong reputation in Jamaica. But Miller was an unstoppable ball of energy who was almost bursting with music inside of him. Rockers Records, on the other hand, was a new label and couldn't afford the costs of recording as often as Miller would have wanted. Miller then began to turn his attention to a growingly popular band in Kingston called Inner Circle. The band which had been formed by brothers Ian and Roger Lewis already had a few singles in the market but were known more for doing covers of popular American songs. Inner Circle used to rehearse at the same spot every week and Jacob Miller in his forceful funny style would always go to watch them and during breaks he would shout through the window that Inner Circle needed him and they wouldn't become great without the great Jacob Miller. He kept it up for months and practically wore the Lewis brothers out and they recruited Miller to be the band lead singer after the exit of some members of the band including Cat Core and Bonnie Ruggs who left to form their own group Third World. The group took to Miller quickly because he was always cracking jokes and making everybody laugh. He was also very hard working and was blessed with a phenomenal voice. And just as Jacob had predicted, his addition to the group meant that Inner Circle suddenly had one of the baddest lineups in reggae music with Roger Lewis on guitar, Ian Lewis on bass, Rashid McKenzie on the drums, Bernard Harvey on the keyboards and Jacob Killer Miller on lead vocals. The band began to release fantastic songs that would become classics such as Forward Jar Children, Tired Felix Weed and Amanati, which was a cover of Bob Marley and the Whalers Soul Rebel. The band's popularity exploded and in 1976 they were signed to Capitol Records. They released two classic albums in 1977 titled Reggae Thing and Ready for the World. Miller had a unique vocal style. He sang with a staccato, almost stuttering technique that was used as counterplay to the rhythm sections, a style he used to devastating effects 
on the songs Tired Felic Weed and Tenement Yard. And of course, he inspired many copycats and addressed them on the song Too Much Imitator. He had become extremely popular and influential musician and was even beginning to draw comparisons with Bob Marley. He was very well rounded with all of the qualities that big stars have. He was endowed with an effervescent personality, charm, loads of singing and songwriting ability and he looked like a star. He was big, chubby and good looking. Not to mention his electric stage presence and outrageous antics that included throwing playful jibes at his fellow musicians. He was one of the highlights of 1978 One Love Peace concert and gave what has gone down as a legendary performance. His larger than life antics had him grab a police inspector's hat and wear it while performing on stage with a gigantic spliff in his hand. Of course, to the delight of the crowd. He also called up Claudie Massop and Bucky Marshall on stage for a demonstration of the peace pact as both men were leaders of the rival political gangs that had virtually brought Jamaica to its knees. In the same year, Miller and the band would appear in the classic movie Rockers, where he gave a performance that was almost identical to his real character. Miller was at the height of his popularity and was so influential that he was even close friends with then Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley. Legendary drummer Leroy Horsmouth Wallace gave an account of how close Miller and Manley were and said that one day he accompanied Miller to the Prime Minister's office and while Miller and the Prime Minister were having a discussion, Miller put his feet up on the PM's table and acted at terrified Horsemouth as he felt that they would both be arrested and locked up. Miller was as revolutionary as they come but he always exhibited this with so much charm and humor that Babylon just didn't know how to react to him. Inner Circle's phenomenal performance at the One Love Peace concert caught the attention of Island Records that signed the group and firmly placed the band in the elite brackets of prestigious labor mates like Bob Marley and Bonnie Whaler. And in 1979, they released their first album for Island in the appropriately titled Everything Is Great. It was a huge hit and spawned two songs that became very popular internationally. Their next album for Island was released in 1980 and was called New Age Music. And thanks to Island Records' international spread, it began to make waves abroad. Miller was at his charismatic peak and as frontman for the hottest band on the island, he was on top of the world. He became close friends with his label mate, Bob Marley, who at the time regarded Miller and Dennis Brown as the best singers in Jamaica. After completing a string of shows in Europe, Miller traveled to Brazil with Island Records boss Chris Blackwell and Bob Marley for the grand opening of the new Island Records office in that country and they returned to Jamaica on Friday the 21st of March 1980. Two days later, on Sunday the 23rd of March, Miller had gone to rehearse for an upcoming tour at Bob Marley's house at 56 Hope Road in Kingston and headed out to a new nightclub that Inner Circle had just opened called The Zinc Fence on Dumfries Street about 10 minutes from where Marley lived. He turned up at the club and after a while stepped out to go buy some sugarcane from a popular cellar on Alfred Street close by. As he was driving back to the zinc fence, he accidentally dropped a cane that he was chewing on just before a notorious sharp bend that claimed lives before. He took his eyes off the road for a second too long and the car slammed into a wall and that was the end of Jacob Miller at just 27 years old. Miller and Inner Circle had just been preparing to go on tour with Bob Marley and the Wheelers in America and Miller's next album, Mixed Moods, had already been recorded and was set to be released just before he passed on. The impact was so great on Miller's bandmates inner circle that the band left Jamaica and moved to Miami just to be far away from the memories of the loss of their dear friend and colleague. So that was the end of Jacob Miller but he lives on in the hearts of reggae fans through his music and the wonderful memories of one of the most iconic and likeable reggae stars of all time. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until the next time, Jabless. bless.